Well, to kick off our uh, program this morning, uh, it's appropriate to have our, our host uh, commander here, uh, General Dennis Vi, the commander of Army Materiel Command, to give us an update and perspective from Army Materiel, Army Materiel Command. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming General Dennis Vi. Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome back to Huntsville, Madison County, and Redstone Arsenal. General Sullivan, sir, again, we want to thank you for your tremendous service uh, to our United States Army, both in uniform and culminating as our 32nd Chief of Staff of the Army, and as President and CEO of the Association of the United States Army. We are fortunate and feel very honored that AUSA has decided to return to Huntsville for the third consecutive year. Home of Redstone Arsenal and the Army Materiel Command to host your Global Force Symposium in Exposition. Again, uh, to General Sullivan, a giant of a man, a tremendous leader, the impact you've made to our United States Army and our nation is enormous and will forever owe you a debt of gratitude that can never be repaid. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me again. Another round of applause for General Sullivan. I'd like to recognize several distinguished leaders who are here with us this morning. Uh, many of our retired four-star generals and certainly former AMC commanders. It was wonderful to spend the day yesterday uh, with you. Thank you for the advice and counsel and ensuring that I was still taking care of your command. Tamia Troy Trulock, Mayor, it's always great to have you here. To Honorable McFarland, to Dr. Joe Fitzgerald, a civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army, and to always uh, my better half, who makes me look better on stage uh, wherever I go, Linda. Thanks so much, sweetheart, for being here today. To AUSA's Council of Trustees, regional, state, and chapter presidents, senior fellows, fellow general officers, and members of the Senior Executive Service, our industry and corporate teammates, thank you all for being here. As you know, today is March the 15th, and there's something a bit unsettling about standing on the stage during the Ides of March. So excuse me if I keep looking over my shoulder during my speech. As a featured Army command for this symposium, I think you're in store for a unique professional engagement opportunity this week. The Army Materiel Command, along with Headquarters Department of the Army, and our partners at TRADOC, FORCECOM, and SMDC, from invitations extended by AUSA, have come together with a tremendous lineup of senior Army leaders and executives on an array of presentations and panels to discuss readiness, the top priority for every soldier. Move, shoot, and communicate is a basic task of every soldier, and all three require readiness. That's why the theme for this year's symposium, building readiness today and tomorrow, is so very appropriate. When the future historians write about the early 21st century, I have no doubt they will describe this period as remarkably complex and one of the most potentially dangerous eras in world affairs. Some of our closest allies in Europe are managing a refugee crisis on a magnitude not seen since World War II and facing down a revanchist Russia who is displaying a level of aggression not seen in decades. In the Pacific, China's military modernization and construction of facilities on disputed islands in the South China Sea, and North Korea's continued and increasing cycle of provocation are growing concern 
to many of our Pacific Rim allies. In the Middle East, Iran's malign influence against our friends and allies continues to undermine stability in that volatile region. And our fight against ISIS and other extremists continues in Iraq, Syria, and parts of Africa. Meanwhile, we still have thousands of soldiers, nearly 200,000 deployed to Afghanistan and other parts of the world, and terrorism remains a real and constant threat at home and abroad. But when those future historians write about this dangerous period, I'm also confident they'll spend a great deal of time praising the efforts of the single greatest force for security and stability known in this or any other era, the United States Army, and the more than one million brave men and women, active guard and reserve, who comprise its ranks. Because when all else fails, regardless of how complex or dangerous the situation, no matter where it occurs in the world, our nation can always depend upon the American soldier to accomplish the mission. And when our nation calls upon their service, which occurs more frequently now than ever before, we must be ready. Our leaders must be ready. The organizations they command must be ready. But most of all, the equipment must be ready. In providing his initial priorities to the Army, Chief of Staff General Mark Milley put it plainly, and I quote, readiness is number one. There is no other number one. At the Army Materiel Command, readiness is why we exist. And it is indeed remains our top priority. As the command continues to restructure and align our organizations to remain globally responsive to the geographic combatant commands, logistical requirements, while providing strategic agility and operational flexibility to meet a wide range of global operations and contingencies, while simultaneously supporting operations on every Army installation, all in the face of significantly declining resources and personnel in strength reductions. For, so for the next several minutes, a few minutes, I would like to provide you an AMC perspective on what we're doing to provide that readiness, not just for today's soldier, but for the soldier of the future. One of the many ways AMC is enabling readiness is through the modernization and optimization of Army prepositioned stocks and the building of theater activity sets. These strategically positioned assets, consisting of armor, artillery, engineer, logistics, communications, and intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance equipment, along with sustainment supplies and materiel, provide our Army and the Joint Force with strategic reach. No other force in the world can meet that requirement allowing units to quickly deploy and fall in on equipment that is our most modernized and maintained in the highest state of readiness. During my recent visit to the European Command in September, I was able to witness firsthand the Armored European Activities Set, or EAS. This set, which was first drawn by the 1st Cavalry Division as part of a contingency operation, has transitioned from a battalion size set into a brigade size set that now includes 87 tanks, 138 Bradley fighting vehicles, 18 Paladins, towed artillery, engineering equipment, and communications, intelligence, and reconnaissance assets. I remind you it wasn't too long ago that we removed the last tank out of Europe, and now we're pushing to put 200 tanks back into Europe. The EAS is one of eight equipment sets that will be established around the world over the next few years, enabling U.S. regionally aligned forces and partner nations to participate in multinational training exercises and contingency operations with increased responsiveness and decreased deployment timelines. In U.S. Central Command, we continue to support operations in Afghanistan, ensuring units deployed or deploying in theater are equipped to successfully conduct Operation Freedom Sentinel. 
We reestablish logistics capabilities in Iraq in support of Operation Inherent Resolve with contracting support, foreign military sales and brigade logistics support teams forward deployed with these units, providing aviation, artillery, and heavy equipment maintenance and support. And as our Army continues its rebalance towards the Pacific, AMC is ramping up its support to the U.S. Pacific Command as well. We're in direct support of Pacific Pathways, training deployments, providing logistics, transportation, and sustainment-based support. We're also in the process of establishing activity sets in the Pacific Rim, similar to those that we've established and are establishing in Europe. Last summer, AMC encased the colors of the 402nd Army Field Support Brigade in Hawaii to expand the command's direct reach in support of U.S. Army Pacific and the Pacific Command Theater. In Korea, AMC supported the deployment of the 2nd Brigade 1st Cavalry Division from Fort Hood, Texas, the first rotational brigade combat team to serve in Korea. This powerful effort reassures our allies, the ROC Army and the South Korean people, and also demonstrates U.S. commitment and resolve in the region. During a visit to the peninsula last month, I met with Colonel Sean Bernabe, commander of the 2nd of 2-1 CAV. After he got past the point of why this four-star general was coming down to see this brigade commander, we had an opportunity to talk about his mission. I was enormously impressed with the mission and capabilities demonstrated by his brigade in training with the Republic of Korea Army, the ROC Army. But most of all, I was impressed with his command's ability to maintain it, their equipment at or above Army Fleet Readiness Standards as he began to turn over that mission and that equipment to 1-1 CAV. That speaks to readiness at the highest level and what all of our brigade combat teams need to be able to achieve. And in support of U.S. Africa Command, last October the Army Field Support Battalion Italy, located in Laverno, was redesignated to Army Field Support Battalion Africa. This provides General Dave Rodriguez with a battalion support that we will grow into a brigade to provide his reach back into AMC to provide the capabilities he requires throughout his theater of operations. This battalion receives, maintains, stores, and issues Army preposition stocks, links national logistics capabilities, and provides logistics solutions to Army units south of the Alps, specifically U.S. Army Africa and our other strategic partners in the region. In the area of foreign military cells, AMC, through the U.S. Army Security Assistance Command continues to maintain a very strong and active program, supporting every COCOM commander's theater security cooperation efforts. FMS continues to reach record numbers, yielding billions of dollars in new business and increasing in capacity and capabilities of our allies and interoperability with our own forces. In Africa, we negotiated a nearly $1.4 billion in FMS sales in 2015, including Abrams tank conversions to the country of Morocco and Black Hawk helicopters to Tunisia. We had $11.8 billion worth of cases in CENTCOM, including Patriot Systems and Black Hawks, to Saudi Arabia. Our presence in UCOM remains strong at more than $674 million in 2015, which included the sale of Chinooks to the Netherlands and Black Hawks to Slovakia. And in the PACOM, the sale of turbine engines, aircraft components, radar and technical assistance, and training to India helped us achieve $1.2 billion in sales for that AOR. <coughs> Closer to home in Northcom, <coughs> excuse me. Closer to home in Northcom, we saw one billion worth of cases, including Humvees to Mexico and the sale of self-propelled howitzers refurbishment to Brazil. It helped us achieve more than 134 million in sales in U.S. Southcom. In all, 2015 closed out with FMS sales 
totaling over $20 billion. And we're anticipating at least $15 billion plus this year. FMS represents a win, win, win for our Army, for the defense industrial base, and for our organic industrial base facilities. Speaking of the industrial base, although workload at these organic facilities is approaching pre-war levels, the Army's organic industrial base continues to deliver readiness through the resetting of rotary aircraft, Abrams tanks, strikers, and engineering equipment, manufacturing of critical parts and components, and the production of munitions. I recently referred to our OIB as our national security insurance policy. You may not need it every day, but when you do need it, you want to ensure that that policy is in full force. The OIB provides our Army the ability and flexibility to surge to meet equipment readiness requirements while maintaining unique manufacturing skill sets within our Army. This was evidence again last month when the Army delivered 5,000 short tons of munitions to Europe on short notice, the largest shipment of munitions since World War II. Without the OIB, and without having the capabilities that we have in place today, this would not have been possible. Another example is the Joint Manufacturing and Technology Center at Rock Island Arsenal in Illinois, which recently developed a new line of communications bridge that has 87% less parts than its predecessor, making it easier to employ and cheaper to maintain. We also continue to leverage public-private partnerships which allow private companies to utilize these facilities and their workforce of skilled artisans. At Ward of Elite Arsenal in New York, Electroloy, a world-class custom melter of specialty steel, had a commercial rotary forge requirements which Ward of Elite had the means and the capabilities to fulfill. Through public-private partnership, Electroloy invested millions of dollars of equipment and space upgrades, and added 20 additional employees to support the workload. Earlier this year, they extended that agreement for 20 years, and Electric Lloyd plans to increase their investment at the arsenal, hire additional personnel, and absorb all available capacity on three full shifts. At the Anderson Army Depot here in Alabama, General Dynamics Land Systems has a work share partnership for their work on the Stryker double V hull conversion. And at Toby Hanna Army Depot in Pennsylvania, Durco Aerospace has a direct sales partnership for a tip to tell H60 performance based logistics upgrade and depot level repair of electronic components for the UH 60 Seahawk. And at Red River Army Depot in Texas, BAE Systems also has a direct sales partnership for the conversion and reset of track and road wheels on the Bradley Fighting Vehicle, and the depot has an agreement with Caterpillar to rebuild engines. Again, these are win, win, win opportunities for all involved and are just a few examples of the more than 350 public-private partnerships we had last year that were worth more than half a billion dollars. And we're always looking for more. Meanwhile, as many of you observed, when the Army's fiscal year 2017 budget was released last month, we remain in physically challenging waters, with a constant challenge to strike a balance between funding modernization, in strength, and readiness. As a result, we're constantly looking for ways to gain the most out of every federal dollar. And through the use of better buying power initiatives, workforce training, customer communications, and continuous process improvements. Our U.S. Army Contracting Command recently negotiated a $247 million in reductions in cost avoidance on $1.5 billion Apache contract. This allowed the Army to purchase nine additional aircraft ahead of schedule. Now that's delivering readiness. They also negotiated $860 million in savings on the PAC-3, the Patriot PAC-3 production contract. And we're also adapting our logistics systems and processes to better support our readiness objectives. 
AMC's Logistics Modernization Program, or LMP, a $2.5 billion investment, replaced 35-year-old legacy systems and now provides greater accuracy, reliability, and speed. LMP allows us to deliver readiness in support of global operations, and AFC is advancing efforts to better manage our Army's global supply chain. Another way AMC delivers readiness is through our many research and development efforts. Our scientists and engineers are busy working in state-of-the-art facilities and laboratories and partnering with academia and industry to help empower, unburden, protect, and sustain our soldiers on the battlefields of today as well as tomorrow. I recently had the opportunity to visit the Institute for Soldier Nanotechnologies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in Boston, where a team of MIT, Army, and industry partners are working to discover and field new technologies that may dramatically advance soldier protection and survivability. Among these many innovations they were exploring are polymer actuators that, for instance, could allow clothing to become rigid on demand, helping to splint wounds or prevent movements after head or neck injuries. Materials and devices to enable control release of medications and methods for accelerated medical diagnostics. And through nano scales and nano enabled materials and devices, soldiers could more safely operate in dangerous environments through capabilities to sense toxic chemicals, pressure, and temperature shield their electronics from electromagnetic interference, and allow groups of soldiers to communicate free of enemy eavesdropping. A concern that has continued throughout my career is the amount of weight that our soldiers still are required to carry, much of it as a result of the technology and the additional batteries, uh, pounds of batteries that these devices require. So in an effort to unburden our soldiers, the U.S. Army Research Development Engineering Command, RDCOM, and the Army Research Laboratory have developed soldier-borne energy harvesting and distribution technologies, which use the body's natural movements to charge batteries. With these soldier-borne energy harvesting devices, tomorrow's soldiers will be able to power their communications equipment, sensors, and battlefield situational displays without having to return to the base while carrying much less weight. The Army Research Lab is also coordinating with the National Football League on ways that we can protect our soldiers and their players from concussions. With the help of a grant from the NFL, Army researchers at Aberdeen Proving Ground recently developed a promising innovation, an elastic tether that connects the helmet and the body. This tether works as a type of shock absorber, preventing whiplash and reducing the impact from collisions. And while our scientists conduct basic research in hopes of producing breakthroughs, it's important to note that they're also very responsive to the immediate needs of our soldiers in the field today. One example of this is the continual effort is the Integrated Respiratory and Eye Protection, SCARF, or IREPS, this early prototype was developed at the U.S. Army Edgewood Chemical Biological Center. Researchers had heard there that special operations soldiers indicated that while deploying riot control agents during raids, donning the traditional full face piece respirator type mask took much too time and too difficult to put on. And so they came up with this device to be able to cut that time in operation and will continue to develop. It has been said for centuries that the Army marches on his stomach, and that goes especially for today's soldier, who expends more calories and may be patrolling in austere environments for many days without resupply. That's why researchers at the U.S. Army Natick Soldier Research Development Engineering Center, or Natick, are constantly working to produce food tailor made for the unique needs of the American warfighter. In case you missed breakfast this morning, some of Natick's new turkey bacon will be available at the Army display. <laughs> this healthy, high protein, low fat, low salt, 
snack does a remarkable job retaining its moisture, and I'm sure it'll be a favorite among our soldiers. Meanwhile, Natick is also experimenting with 3D, uh, 3D printed food, which will allow customized meals to be produced in the field and tailored for an individual soldier's specific nutritional needs. <clears throat> so based upon real-time monitoring of their phys physiological and nutritional status, food could be printed that's high in protein or high in carbohydrates, for instance. Many other innovations are currently in the field, empowering and protecting our soldiers in harm's way. One that you can see displayed outside of the Von Braun Center is the Containerized Weapon System, or CWS. The CWS is a fully contained within a standardized shipping container, making it easily transportable, and two soldiers can deploy the system within 30 minutes. Then its Crow's weapon platform with an integrated javelin missile can, be provide, can provide 360 degree coverage. I was able to witness this system out at Fort Bliss uh, this past fall, and it is truly, truly impressive. And in an era when our soldiers often deploy to rapid, rapidly to remote locations, systems like the CWS can greatly enhance force protection for FOBs, COPs, airfields, and other high-value locations and remote outposts. <clears throat> Sustaining the soldier in these austere and hostile environments remains a challenge. In some areas in Iraq and Afghanistan, most of the casualties came from our ground vehicle movements, and movement by air also remains dangerous. <clears throat> in an effort to reduce those risks, the Army has been working to develop fully autonomous systems, both on land and in the air, and these are closer to reality than you might imagine. We've already successfully tested partially autonomous convoy systems, and recently the U.S. Army Tank Automotive Research Development and Engineering Center, or TARDAC, conducted a successful ground-air cooperative demonstration with autonomous capabilities. As you'll see in this video, an autonomous Black Hawk helicopter, manned only with an emergency test pilot, successfully retrieved the ground vehicle and then flew a 12-mile route to a landing zone. After it was released, the ground vehicle then autonomously navigated a six-mile simulated reconnaissance mission. It's important to note that these weren't simply remotely controlled. They were capable of fully autonomous operation. These pilotless and driverless vehicles could deliver supplies through hostile areas, navigating through hazards to bring supplies to positions of both urban and rural environments. This will not only increase logistics flexibility and re reduce the logistics footprint, it will more importantly reduce soldier fatalities. As many of you in the audience are aware, a large component of our Army readiness is ensuring that our soldiers are trained and capable of maintaining and sustaining their equipment. But our soldiers and units' ability to su sustain their equipment has atrophied over the past decade as a result of increased op-tempo and an over-reliance on contractor logistics support. Some of you may be old enough to remember that one way we addressed keeping our soldiers informed on maintenance and supply was through the PS Magazine. Times change, of course, and so has the way our young soldiers receive information. AMC, through the Logistics Support Activity, or LOGSA, is also changing the way that we provide this information to our soldiers. In a few months, LOGSA will be introducing the digital PS Magazine mobile app to help empower our soldiers to increase their unit readiness. And Master Sergeant Halfmast is here to tell you about it. Thank you, sir. For over 64 years, soldiers have been flipping through the pages of PS Magazine, finding information on vehicle engines, aircraft rotor blades, radios, generators, kitchens, tents, weapons, helmets, and field gear, all to ensure our Army is ready to defend the nation. That's a lot of thumb turning. Quite frankly, I'm not sure I could hold all the recent issues of PS Magazine in my hands without dropping them. I'm just not that dexterous. 
But like General Vi said, we're going digital in June, 65 years after our first issue in June 1951. And today you get to sample what our digital editions will be like in Apple and Android formats. Check this out. Thank you, Master Sergeant Halfmast. Thank you, sir. Hua. So while the PS Magazine mobile app will help our soldiers maintain the best equipment available today, AMC remains committed to developing even better innovations for tomorrow. Finally, our most effective tool of maintaining readiness is also our most important asset, and that's our people. With more than 64,000 military and civilian personnel and another 60 to 80,000 contractors and host nation employees, AMC's dedicated workforce remains the cornerstone of everything we do. Our people truly are our most valuable resource. These Army professionals, officers, soldiers, and Army civilians have done some very heavy lifting for more than 15 years of war, the longest period of conflict in our nation's history. And our Army could not accomplish this mission without these tremendous patriots. AMC is absolutely committed to enhancing their performance and resiliency by promoting policy, programs, and training, along with providing professional development opportunities to ensure our Army workforce remains Army strong. AMC is also committed to recruiting and shaping the next generation of Army professionals. AMC's 1,000 Interns Initiative, which we began last year designed to ignite a passion for federal government service, will provide 1,000 college and high school internship opportunities annually for the next five years to expose new talent to careers in federal service. Our first class last summer was a great success with more than 1,200 interns participating. And AMC's Always a Soldier program provides continuity of support to warfighters separating from the armed forces, particularly our wounded warriors. Since the program was initi initiated, nearly 750 veterans with a service-connected disability have been directly hired into AMC to work in our facilities and in our organizations. These are just a few of the many efforts and programs and activities being undertaken in AMC to support our soldiers and to provide readiness to the Joint Force. Before I conclude, I'd like to share a bit, a bit of good news. Thanks to a concentrated, uh, a concerted national effort to hire veterans, coupled with their sought after skills, the unemployment rate for our veterans dropped from a high of 7.6% three years ago when I delivered the first speech on this stage to just 4.1% last month. I know many of these jobs were with companies and organizations represented in this room for today. And for that, I sincerely thank you for providing this opportunity to these great soldiers who have sacrificed so much for our nation. Lastly, over the course of the next few days, I invite you to visit the Army exhibit where you can meet and speak with some of our subject matter experts on the technologies I've highlighted this morning 
along with many more. Most importantly, you'll have an opportunity to meet these great professionals whom I am so privileged to serve as their commanding general. So General Sullivan, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for allowing me this opportunity to share a few thoughts with you this morning. Thank you for all you do, continue to support the Army Materiel Command and our great Army. AMC, sustaining the strength of the nation, Army Strong.